<laughs> so, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, as mentioned, managing director for a studio for 20 plus years and uh, co-founder. Uh, so that puts me 25 plus years in one location. Uh, formed in 1996, acquired by Ubisoft in 2000. Uh, and what we're here for today, they gave me an opportunity to do a keynote and I decided to talk about positioning and planning a pitch. So hopefully you'll see some threads going through this discussion on that topic. Uh, and the main goal is that you have some takeaways, that you find some value in this. Uh, so you're gonna have to dig for it depending on what your role is and what you do. Uh, but uh, again, it's like, kind of like a constructive critique. Uh, you're not supposed to take everything someone says. You're supposed to pick and choose the things that you like the most and the things that align with your interests. Uh, so the book ends, uh, you know, that's, that's the structure of the talk, is find something that, that you can find value in. And uh, it's a fun challenge to do a keynote. It's a lot of liberty, it's a lot of freedom. Uh, and it encourages someone like me to reflect on a long career and to see if I can turn some of those things into talking moments and kind of share on those. So hopefully we can avoid the uh, uh, old man stories, walking uphill both ways kind of side of things, and just kind of jump into some mistakes and challenges and how it relates to the pitching process and how it relates to the origin of the studio. Uh, so, you know, we definitely had some blind luck in there. We had some uh, hard work. We had uh, eventually some planning and some things that happened right. Uh, so it's not just all guessing. Uh, and of course, this comes from my perspective as a studio manager, that means that uh, it's mostly about working with people, trying to help them succeed in their goals, uh, putting out fires, directing traffic. Uh, you know, that's kind of uh, the oversimplification of, of, of a manager. Uh, but when you're designing a game, when you're creating a pitch, and when you're doing a lecture, uh, one of the first aspects that I enjoy the most is the, well, figure out who you're talking to, get to know your audience. Uh, I kind of came with the assumption that we'd be dealing with, because of the show, in the history of the show, a fair bit of students or recent post-grad uh, teachers, some indie, as well as some kind of larger console and PC developers. So I'm sure that we have a mix. Uh, I can see that uh, because I can see some people that I know, and I can see that from just some of the age differences, that we have some variety in the audience. Uh, so uh, plus having some people in the audience that I know makes it a little easier for me uh, because you know that I have a tool built in the audience that says he has to be telling the truth, otherwise he's going to get really ripped on afterwards. Uh, so he can't, he can't just make up everything. But none of the people in the audience have heard this speech because I just wrote it last week. So it's all fresh and new. And that's part of the theme of this in general is that I need to kind of walk the walk, write something, figure out how I wanted to write it, how I wanted to present it, and how it relates to you guys in the audience. So part of my job is to, when doing one of those types of actions, is to take care of the audience like in game development, and take advantage of the audience. So what I mean by that is, well, if you were all students, the structure would be a little different. I would be presenting things differently, talking through things differently. If you were all professionals, I could use a whole lot of shortcuts. I could very easily manage the audience at a different level. Uh, but just imagine the train wreck it would be as if you all just only spoke Spanish. I'd be talking to the wrong audience. I'd be designing a pitch or a speech for the wrong audience. So the relationship you have as a provider, whether it's of talent or information, and the audience is key. And I want to leverage that as much as I can. Because when you're doing a pitch, you're basically making choices that have long-reaching impact. You are picking the mountains that you have to climb. So uh, what does this mean to me? It means that the definition of success 
implies a relationship between the person with the goal and the people receiving. Uh, that's an important relationship that I can find value in, and I'll talk about that as I go. Uh, because what if I knew everyone before the lecture? What if I knew all of your profiles? What if I knew what schools you went to and what interests you had? Then obviously I would hit a better target relationship with the audience. What if you all had identical interests? Because when again, you're thinking about me trying to draw a correlation between my lecture and game design, you know that you have that relationship with the audience. You know you have fans of a genre. So you know the information, you just have to apply it. So what if you all had the same interests? What if you all had the same skills? What if you all had the same piece of technology in your hand? Well, I could have just beaten the pitch to every one of you in that one moment, and then suddenly everyone is on target. Well, those are the types of challenges that we take on when we say, well, we want to design this game for this audience, or we want to design this game for this platform. Does mountains kind of change depending on which ones you take on. And that comes down to the, the essence of uh, knowledge of you, the audience, can empower me and help me make choices that I'm not going to be the one taking on all those battles. It's a whole team or a whole company. So that's how important it is to me that you scope a pitch. Because those words can't be just thrown around. You can't just casually say, oh, let's add these 10 features when you can only technically afford to add five. So it helps me to think about the audience so that we can manage and scope control projects. So that's how I ended up with positioning and planning a pitch as my goal. And then I set out to write an abstract, just like I would have to write for a pitch. Uh, and I'll read that off. Projects start with a pitch, equal importance, part creativity and business. Regardless of new IP or sequel, it's to an established brand. Each team needs to create a pitch that can communicate and align partners on scope, vision, and risk. From market positioning, feature quality, quantity, the pitch needs to build a promise to both partners and customers. So I wrote that as my initial abstract. And I realized that almost everything about that was gen generic. It didn't have a thing to do with me. So then I had to layer in the cake. I had to figure out how I was going to take that and make that more, make that something that I could relate to. So that's the important part is in like making a game, the whole game can't be generic. There has to be some of those unique sales propositions, USPs. So other people have unique selling points. So there has to be some of that in there so that there's some value to what you're doing. So again, we don't want to just make generic games. Uh, so early on, I'd like to address those kind of big obvious issues, or what some, some people call it elephants in the room. Uh, is this a basic concept? Yes. Is it any less critical? No. So, I anticipate a lot of students and young professionals. Pitching planning is essential to the scope process. It's essential to setting out a vision for your team and your brand. And I encourage people to take an honest look at their pitches, their audience, and the industry history because there's a lot of information there that helps make those mountains bigger or smaller. You're taking on a lot of work and you're signing up a lot of other people to do that work. So, Take a moment and reflect on any year in gaming. It's really easy to take a look at the recent ones, but take a look at any year in gaming and look at the number of delays, the resulting impact, and just evaluate the results. How many people overscope their projects, underdeliver, and delay their projects? I mean, it's almost consistent. Whose fault is that? Well, it's really tangled. Everyone's project is unique. But there's a fair, generous amount of overscoped initial pitch. So can you control that right from the concept? 
I kind of envision playing the game before it's ever made, because then you can compare it to other games, and you can kind of guess your way to how much risk you're taking on. So, uh, I think that's worthy enough to talk about. Uh, hopefully, it helps people to stay on target. Uh, you know, understand that you're in good company. The industry as a total is not good at this. And I'm not up here to say we were any better at the beginning. We kind of got better along the way. But part of this speech will detail some of those early stories so that we can be fair and honest and say, yeah, you got to learn how to do this. But part of coming to these lectures is learning how to do this. So um, it's not promoting a full design at the beginning. That still has to come on its own. But you can conceptualize enough to go, how much are we taking on versus different games in the genre? Your job is to kind of analyze that as there's still seeds before you plant them. So uh, when you're looking at the industry, you have to understand that knowledge is just knowledge. It's not a mandate. It's not a dictate. If you end up letting other people's products over influence you, you will never get done. So. You just kind of have to trust in the fact that it's power for you, not over you. But we fell into that trap early on also. So the idea of doing a talk based on elephants, easy concepts, low-hanging fruit, uh, it's kind of like any kind of training. The phrase that I use most often, it's like the lumberjack has to sharpen the ax. Doesn't matter how good a lumberjack he is, eventually sharpen the ax. So if I talk about some basic concepts, it's just because you have to stay up with them. And if you talk about elephants, then you have to acknowledge that the biggest elephant, or the woolly mammoth in the room, is the ego of the individual team members who will help make your game, or the ego of the individual who's designing the pitch. So if you, yourself, are the mammoth, then get over it, because ego is just the trap that will make you next year's story of a delayed game. So, this means that we have to highlight some of Red Storm's early business history, development challenges, and design philosophy so that you can see a little bit into why I think pitching and understanding how a pitch can be developed is important. So, it'd be easy for me to do the rest of the speech and kind of highlight some of the successes, and I'm going to turn it the opposite. I'm going to try to say, here's some of the challenges. Uh, but I'm also going to say, we are 25 or six years into this, and we've made a lot of games. That means we've had a good amount of successes, and overall that means we have been successful at being a studio. So this isn't a pity story. Uh, we did amazing things, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, it just means that some of our challenges at the beginning weren't necessarily public because people didn't have to tell the horror stories. We got to tell the success stories. Uh, and if you looked at any of our websites, you know that the main titles, you know, there's probably about 25 or 30 that are listed up there uh, and a whole lot of Clancy-based games. So that becomes part of the story. There's also some other things in there that are of note. When we took uh, the acquisition by UB, and how it changed the studio, so a little bit of information on that. Uh, you'll notice also that as we get later on, especially in the UV years, CODEV had to come into play, so we weren't controlling the whole flow of the game, we were controlling our part of that. Uh, so there's several different things in here that help make Red Storm what it is. Uh, also, many, many brands, uh, some that we made and some that we just contributed to. Those are all good stories. We just don't have time to cover all of it in such a sort of short session together. Uh, the current studio highlights, uh, I have a great management team. I have a lot of people that I've worked with a long time. And we have an excellent history of past, present, and hopefully future employees to help make all of these games. So we do this as a team. Uh, we're about 180 people, we're local. We are currently working on an expansion to the division, which is called Parkins, uh, which will be free to play and expand the brand. We're also currently working on 
Assassin's Creed VR, which means we get to play with new tech and we get to take one of UB's biggest brands to that space. Uh, so that's part of the reason why I got in the industry, because it keeps reinventing itself. The challenges are there and it's fun to do. Uh, but to create product, well, we have to kind of set that course. We have to do a vision and we have to follow up on it. Uh, and now that we work, well now, uh, for the past 20 years we've worked with Ubisoft and uh, that means it's kind of different from those early days. We have to have a little bit more formal process and a little bit more multiple people to get on board with a pitch. And they have wonderful brands and it creates a big comfortable company that we can easily work under uh, because what comes with those bigger companies is more time, more people, sometimes more money to do bigger games. Uh, and of course they have more things like books and games and TV shows and all that kind of stuff. Uh, movies and you know they're still trying on all those fronts. Uh, so the gut check comes in that says, yes, I have made and validated and killed multiple pitches. So this comes from a history of talking about this with people. Um, made those decisions before and after the acquisition, so it's long running. Uh, and I find it to be one of the most exciting and critical times for doing game development because it has the most potential to have an impact on the projects and the people. People can be really excited about just being part of a game design pitch. Uh, it makes a, uh, a better person overall for the studio because they understand that they have an impact. Uh, and soon they understand that they have an impact just as a design partner. Uh, it doesn't matter what their job is. They're making a lot of decisions about how to make the customer happy. Uh, so uh, we want to acknowledge that we have a lot of people who are paid to do the designing and the pitching. We have designers, narrative writers, we have creative directors. They're the ones who primarily do the work because they're the ones who are most trained to do the work, but we want to try to cultivate that open sense, that an open pitch policy whenever we can. So talking about people, about pitches, internally, externally, uh, that's just living up to the idea that anyone can be contributor to the base game design. You don't want to just say, well, those are the people, those are the ones trained for it, because your expert in that individual genre might be the one sitting next to you working on the art staff. It might be one of the youngest people in the company if you're trying to tap into a new market. So I encourage a more open pitch process uh, and very team-based collaboration whenever you can afford it to do it. Part of this uh, conversation since it was just written is my thoughts on the subject now not necessarily the thoughts as we implemented them over the last 20 years but some of this has been consistent because we've had those game pitch jams where we've encouraged people to uh, come out and you know pitch a sequel or pitch a, a concept of their own we've done them for fun and we've done them for targeted reasons so they have different purposes sometimes it's just because you really want people to understand the pitch process so they respect it. Sometimes it's just so that they get extra training in their presentation skills. You want people to be the cheerleader for that game or that feature that they want, but it, it's a cheerleader. Because what you don't want is the snake oil salesman. You don't want people just trying to sell you something because they think it's cool, because it really needs to be justified by the relationship with the audience. It needs to be justified by sales potential. It can't be just because they are momentarily you know, enamored with that kind of concept. Because when it comes down to it, the way I'm saying it is the pitch is a business plan, the pitch is part creativity, and supported by as much research as you can. So we can include things that it's obvious, like the feature, descriptions, and narrative, and the world building goals. Uh, but it's a mix, and it's a mix based on varying audiences. So we want to educate people enough so they understand that the pitch is not necessarily to the customer. It's a lot about the customer, but your first customer is more you. 
So how do you do a pitch? How do you get a concept across to someone? And in some businesses, it can start as a one-pager. That's certainly the way Ubisoft, or sorry, the way Red Storm started. It's more of a one-pager. Or it can be a little bit of the elevator story. So if you know what an elevator story is, it's kind of an obvious statement. It's how fast can you describe your concept while you're riding up an elevator to the executive when you just had those few minutes to be in the same space. Uh, it's more about shared common knowledge and shorthand speak. How can you condense your concept down to the smallest moment in time? Now this, this reference won't go for everyone, uh, but it's the one I like because it's the shortest one I know. So if you were in a Hollywood studio some kind of like 40 years ago, I guess, um, and you had shared knowledge and you said the concept of jaws on pause, then you would be using common knowledge to say, we know this person saw the movie Jaws. We know they can probably guess that the word pause means dog. And then you slam that together and you get the pitch for Cujo. So how short can you describe something using common knowledge? We have game genres, we have game history. We can do those micro challenges, but that's not a pitch. That's just a high level concept enough to hopefully get the door open for you to have more conversations. So pitches more than that. You'll have your own version of doing pitches. I'm more talking about the function than the final form. I'm trying to make sure that we leverage as much on building a concept that's reinforced by some measurable aspects of audience and market data. So we're going to jump from there and say, regardless, as I said before, you have one customer at a minimum, and that customer is you. You have to have something, just like I needed when writing the abstract for this to stay on target, you need something so that you stay on target. Sometimes that expands out to saying your first customer is your team members. Well, that's fine too. So we can say they're included. When we were established in 1996, we had several customers that we had to consider. And that was important for us in our story and in our moment. So we had a small group of developers. We had to kind of use what we had as leverage and what we had as potential and kind of push that as much as possible. Uh, and for those of you who know the history of our games, uh, you see the name Tom Clancy connected to a lot of it. Uh, it may be obvious if you read the bio, heard a little bit more about the company, you know that he helped start us. Uh, so we often get asked who's Clancy or tell us more about Clancy. Uh, some of the obvious low hanging fruit is he was an author, an author with money who liked to try to invest that money where he could to make more money. You know, beyond that, it gets into the details of the man. try to buy the Minnesota Vikings. He, you know, he just liked to do whatever he could do now that he had money. And that's not a bad thing. It just means that he was interested in us of the moment and he wanted to leverage that uh, to make more money. Uh, and uh, he was an interesting guy. Uh, we'll say that, uh, you know, obviously he made books that turned into movies and then some of those turned into games. So there's a part of that story there, and he was connected to us. He was the chairman for our studio during those early independent years. Uh, you know, he's kind of known for being a person of his time. Uh, means that he had some rough edges. But he was really important to us because he basically opened many doors. So he was a brand. How can we take that? We are doing our pitches, and how can we leverage that? He helped us start a studio. We began with about 19 people. Uh, and, uh, you know, that kind of leveraged us to say who we are for the moment. Uh, I want to throw in a quick aside here. It was also because we spun out of Virtus, and they were also uh, part of the funding team for our studio. Uh, 
and the reason why Clancy was connected was because he was on the board of Virtus. He was a fan of uh, the Virtus founder's original game called The Colony. So David Smith did a game in about 1988. Uh, was what kind of noted as the first 3D interactive game, the precursor to a lot of first, for, to the first person shooter genre. Uh, so there's some heritage there that uh, definitely I wanted to give credit to. Um, so we had people with interest and money backing us. We had done a game together, SSN, as I mentioned earlier, and we spun out into our own company. Uh, but it was during a time where, well, I'll face it, a lot of you weren't born. Uh, and it was done at a time where the games were very restrictive. The technology was still pretty weak. But we still had the same classic pitch problem. So just because it was 25 plus years ago doesn't mean we're out of date in terms of uh, the techniques. It just means that our restrictions were different. Uh, so machines were slow. Uh, we had to take advantage of what we could, which was we were an independent developer. Uh, we had some ups. We had money in the bank for at least the first six months. Uh, we had an international best-selling author, and that gave us a lot of potential. Uh, but we need to figure out how to go from nothing to something, and that means we had to start with a pitch meeting. We had to start with building our concepts, discussing them, figuring out which ones made the most sense for us as a business, and that's the key, what made the best sense for us. Not necessarily the best game, the best sense for us. The team that we had, the people that we had, the skills that we had, the technology that we had, all of that comes into play in what is the best for us or you. So, you know, we're all in the chase to make great games, but, you know, it has to match. And it has to match with your potential and your brand. At that point, we were young and new. We didn't have the established brand, but everybody knew what we were going to work on just because of who we were connected with. So, this part is the don't necessarily do it the way that we did it, but it's good to hear some stories about people's mistakes and challenges um, because they might prevent you from doing that. Uh, so, uh, obviously if it weren't for Clancy and some blind luck, we wouldn't be able to uh, be a company now. Uh, and I do have to, because if you don't know, I mean obviously a lot of time has passed between now and then. I did forget to mention that it's the late author, Tom Clancy. So, died a while back, uh, but, uh, you know, we still keep up with some of his family, and, uh, you know, his son Tom is uh, connected to the game industry, uh, but uh, you can read a Wikipedia page on that and find all about him and the craziness. I can just say that, as I said before, it was, he was a character. Uh, his favorite thing in the studio was probably to walk around with a drink and a cigarette, and basically, if he saw anything that he liked, he'd say, shit, I, and that was, you know, his level of contribution because he was a writer and he enjoyed being a writer. But he really also enjoyed being connected to people. Uh, if he had a superpower, it would be getting information or guessing very well about what information was like because he was known for making those techno thriller kind of books that made people feel like one of the top Google messages is, was Tom Clancy in the CIA? It's like, no, he was an insurance salesman. But he had a good creative mind, and he put the work into it, and he enjoyed it, and that's a measure of success. So, uh, in the early years, it was kind of crazy as a studio. As I said, we started out with about 19 people. Um, I can mention the fact that in the first seven years, besides Christmas breaks, I never took a vacation day because starting a company is not easy. But is it worth it? Yes. So uh, it's just the kind of thing that you have to understand that we didn't come across with any high hopes of Midas touch. We didn't think that we uh, had everything right. Uh, we didn't 
succeed in everything we published, and we didn't even publish everything that we worked on. Uh, but in the long run, we did thrive and survive. Uh, but it was because we accepted our limitations and leveraged them as much as we could in terms of our brand. And that's a lot of conscious choices. You understand that when I'm talking about early PC days, that it's all about the limitations. Uh, any one artist could have made a wonderful game, but it couldn't have a background or anything else if they were the character guy. You had to have restrictive poly counts. You had to have restrictive engine counts. It was all about the compromise. So that's just something that we had to embrace then. And you know that just kind of tells you that we succeeded based mostly on gameplay. Uh, and that's kind of nice because we had an offering that was unique and different. Uh, and you learn quick from your mistakes. And if you embrace your genre, you get a lot of information and you want to move with that as, as much as you can. So, uh, as I mentioned, we were our first customers. Our second customers were the people that we wanted to get money from. They were the banks and book publishers and whatnot, and we had to understand what they wanted to hear from a pitch. Very different. They're basically, they're not gamers. They only care about how we can make money with their money. And then, in essence, they only really cared about how we focused on Clancy, even though we didn't want to only focus on Clancy. So, that gives us a different kind of customer. Our third customers, were our contractual partners, the publishers that we had to use to get the money from the second customers. And they, in turn, needed something different. They did, needed to understand how to sell our games. They had to understand our unique selling points. They had to understand the genres that we wanted to work in. So that gives us first customer, second customer, third customer. Last is the actual customer. They don't get the pitch, they just get the results. So they're still important. You just need to understand how it fits in the chain. So uh, we could easily imagine if we had the crystal ball at the beginning, we would have known we should just jump straight and deep into the Clancy universe. That's fine. We tried a few other things that didn't exactly work out the same. But uh, you know, we have to understand that we needed to grow up and become something. And it wasn't just like a straight line. So, Different customers, different interests, and those are things that when we started with Rainbow Six, we knew by then we had the relationship with Clancy set. We understood a little bit better about what the customers would expect from a Clancy game. And it wasn't our first game, it was just when we started to get into the stride. Uh, so uh, the history of Rainbow Six starts in Red Storm. It's done very well in other UB studios over the years. Uh, so you get to see the glimpse of the beginning and you kind of know, you should know where it is now because it gets a lot of visibility. Uh, you can feel like you had a kid who's grown up to be successful. Um, and you can go onto the websites and look at some of the highlights for the original game. Uh, but we usually have to say that Rainbow Six was an initial success that helped launch the studio, that it received positive reviews because of its immersive feeling, and people also said it was a very difficult game. But we were PC makers at the time. Uh, that kind of allowed us a lot of freedom. It allowed us some latitude. Uh, and it's a tactical shooter, best known to help cultivate the uh, subgenre squad-based tactical shooters focused on realism and on the lethality of play. It leveraged some of the concept that, you know, you had a lot of Quake-style run-and-gun games during that time period. Well, we were kind of splitting the genres between action and tactical, and we were slowing games down purposefully and trying to make them actually feel more lethal, more scary. That was part of the intent because you were a person, not some big cyber soldier or anything like that, and you were with other people. And you could, more often than not, turn a corner and accidentally shoot your own guy. And 
to make you feel tense in that moment and make you feel the connection with your squat, which we were leveraging as one of our main selling points, that lethality became part of the tool. So you can see that we were, even in those early days, leveraging just a few elements of gameplay to try to focus our games. Uh, so it's a genre blender. Uh, we had a big challenge to try to translate the Clancy feel into a game, just like the way the movies had to translate the Clancy feel for their part. So we could watch those films and see how someone else condensed down, and then we could do something similar with our games. Uh, because it needed to be about the heroic effort. It needed to be about uh, the challenges of individuals to save the world. The essence of what Clancy can be. So at the beginning, we just had a classic one-pager. Uh, it was developed by one of the people in the studio. It was a part of about 30 pitches on our day one meetings. Uh, so that helped us kind of start a franchise. We realized early on that the pitches were not necessarily just about cultivating the game. It was about making choices, not just about money, but also about time and engine cycles. That's again the concept that any one of the people on the team could have made the game look or play better, but the engine would only take so much. It's like being at a buffet with all of your friends. Share. You have to get used to the concept that you can only fill your plate so much. So engine restriction still exists. It's not a free domain out there. If you try working for any handheld platform or any uh, reasonable PC limit, then you're still going to be dealing uh, because everyone around you is so talented that it's very easy for them to say, well, I can make this look better. Yes, you can. But in essence, we ask you to not. So those are things that you have to keep in mind when you're allowing that freedom of developing in the pitch. It's like you have to help set some of those limitations as early as possible. So for us, we were all built around the concept of the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario in games is when is your engine going to show lag? When is it going to be obvious that it's now a game and no longer an immersive moment? When does it become a slideshow instead of a free-flowing 3D experience? And we had a terrible worst-case scenario. We were all squad-based tactical. So that means that you could have all your squads show up in one scene at once, all the enemies run in the room, and you could all throw grenades at the same time. And the machine could just stop. So we had to make sure that our game could survive some of those worst case scenarios. So you can look at games of that time and go, wow, that fighter game looks great. Well, it's their worst case scenario is two people, one set, a few special effects. Nothing to compare with a squad based game. But the consumer, well, they don't care about that. So you have to find ways to compensate. You have to find ways to make sure that you can get visibility for your project, that you can entice people, that at least the people who know enough about games can say, yeah, they did a good thing. So we had to leverage as much as we could off what we thought was important and make sure that, you know, in general, the team still had fun developing it and the challenge that came with it, but they had to have enough creative freedom to, to feel like they were doing something worthy. So uh, we doubled down on the squad effort. Uh, and like I said, luckily, 24 years later, it's still thriving as a brand. So along the way, there were many sequels, many mission packs, side projects. And each time, we needed pitches. But now the pitches were more about what's the same, what's different. That becomes the engagement that you have for sequels. It's like you have to retell your story. You have to figure out. What are you going to work on that stays the same? What are you going to work on that needs to change? What's the relationship with the audience? How are they reacting to the product? How much time has spanned since your last initial release? All of that starts to come into play because the fans have a different expectation. That's just normal. You have a lot of information out there, 
you can get from the sales data, the Metacritic's, web comments, and streams, because that is just a right resource for you to understand your audience. Uh, so I believe that the pitch process is this kind of intersection. I believe it's like part creativity, part audience evaluation, and part industry information. So that's my crossroads. And where they intersect, there's a bubble that is your team's potential. That's an oversimplified concept, but basically it means that you know you can make your challenge bigger or smaller. Your team, well, sometimes you can buy tech, sometimes you can get some additional help. But basically, it's kind of estimating what you should put into your project. So, um, in terms of the industry, since I labeled it as one of my important sectors, uh, I'm saying that there's a lot of people out there that do these stream reviews. They're not gamers, but then again, most film critics are not directors. So they know enough to actually help you. So my casual aside on the subject, picked one of the biggest people, mostly because he makes me smile. And that doesn't happen very often, so. Um, I watched some of Markiplier's. And him sitting down and doing his Doom Eternal stream is genuine game review and entertainment at the same time. I've watched that multiple times because I really enjoy the Doom game and I like his review on some of the features and some of the challenges that he sees in terms of narrative art. He did a really great job in terms of looking at the product, at the same time being a fan. So, the, what is it, like eight or nine parts? It's huge, it's like, like sitting for a full day and watching it. Uh, and yes, he's very well known, but the fact is that sometimes they're well known for a reason. Now the other side of that coin, is what can he share with me that I would not have known about? Because the industry is so huge and I can't play every game. I don't want to play every game. But someone like this guy can share with us different things. So his series on getting over with, with Bennett and Foddy is a trend. And it's really scary that you can want to watch a train wreck over and over and over again. <laughs> but it teaches you so much. So what I'm saying is reviews, the industry information, is a great access to taking a class on game design. But the way I wrote it down is it's like going, it's like digging for gold in a dumpster fire. You have to have thick skin, and you have to want to do it. And it's hard work, but it is amazing to get good critical review. It's hard, because the industry can't always be about us sharing. The industry has to be about itself sharing back. So that's what happens in critical reviews. And if you can find some good ones, then I say it is a resource for you to use. So we're dealing with no formulas. We're dealing with just you, your pitch, and how can you scope control it to make sure that it works? Well, all I can say is use that industry knowledge, use that audience knowledge to help offset what your team's ambition may be too high. There's no reason to reinvent every wheel. Narrow it down to just the key features that you think are gonna leverage your game, your concept. And that's what a little bit of the highlights that I've been kind of plugging on is that for us, we obviously had to leverage the Clancy connection. Once we decided that we wanted to focus on squad-based games, then we had to double down on that effort. We had to be willing to walk away from pretty games because we weren't going to get there for years. So you took it on the chin over and over again, and it's well-deserved. We have very much Attack of the Clones. There's, there's a bunch of white shirt waiters running around shooting at you. 
in the early games, and you're just like, yeah, okay, sorry. But that's what we needed to make the game happen. Compromise so that we could focus on the things that were actually unique to us. So when I look at what the function is of a basic pitch, I'm looking for what's fun, I'm looking for what's innovative, I'm looking for what's interesting, but I'm also looking for what's doable and profitable. And I'm going to have to say that yes, I'm doing a little bit of shorthand, I'm running a little bit long, and if someone really loves this topic, then I'm sure what you'll do is look me up on LinkedIn, ask for some of the notes, as long as you put ECGC in the invitation, I'll know it's from this. And then we'll say, okay, here you go. Here's some of the information that I wasn't able to cover. So in terms of what we are discussing and wrapping up kind of where I am, no studio is the same. I'm really pitching the concept of creativity, audience, and industry. I'm really asking you to think about your team members if you're the one writing the pitch. You're controlling whether they're basically going to be on a death march for the next year. You're planting seeds that will grow into trees, sometimes ugly, gnarly trees. And it's going to take a lot of time to prune it down. Or you can be one of those masters of the tiny Japanese trees and make sure that it all works out and it's all beautiful. It's just going to be smaller. So scope control, pitch control. Positioning and planning a pitch has a greater impact on the rest of the project and it's something that is collaborative, it's something that is team-based, it's something that you need to have the same alignment with your team members on because they're the ones who are going to be doing the work. So those are some of the things that I think are important. Uh, there's other things about competition and team size and technology. They're, they're again low hanging fruits. You can do your research on other games and try to figure out what they had to do to get it finished. Uh, so I'm not advocating a world of copycat games or anything like that. I'm saying that the research has value in itself. Studying brands, games, and genres gives you a better understanding on how to focus on your pitch, your design, your production plan, and it has the best chance for you to stay focused on your game and your key features. So that's why I find value in it. So writing this has given me a chance to take a look back, to say, yeah, I can be pleased and amazed at what we've been able to accomplish, and kind of share some of that with you to be something that you can measure against, just one studio story. You need as many of those as you can get. And it's an encouragement to stay a fan of your industry, to stay a fan of your genres, and stay especially a fan of your own work to try to make sure that you get enough success that everyone can be happy, uh, fans and developers alike. So I wish you luck with your pitches, and obviously if we have time, I can take some questions. And since we're up against lunch, that means that I can loiter around here and answer more of those questions. Uh, so that's it for me.
the game designer is going to do what their skill base is going to take them to. So the definition of game designer is so broad that it really depends on that individual person. And so I'd say yes, they could, but they could also be a resource for someone else. Thanks for speaking today. I really appreciate hearing everything. If you, uh, if you don't take a vacation day in seven years, how do you keep from getting burned out? I needed people that worked with me to go, you're being a get bad example. Go, go do something for a while. Um, I took four days off when my kid was born. Bad example. So, Starting a company is a very weird experience. And I went from creative director for the first four years to studio manager immediately after that. So my clock started over when, during the acquisition. I now had a whole new set of different responsibilities that I had to manage. So I had blinders on. And that's just my part of the story is to say, yeah, it was wrong, it wasn't great, I learned from it, I tell people now, don't do that. But I could not do it then. And I think it's just because I was invested. I wanted, first, the first moment, I wanted us to succeed for our own reasons. Then we had someone come in and buy the company. And for some weird reason, I wanted to make sure that they were happy with their investment, to make sure that we could have long careers. So I had plenty of personal reason to make sure it worked. And of course, my job was more diverse then. More hands touching many things. So it was my moment. And I can just say, no, it wasn't right. And I was thankful I saw like Christmas breaks and all. But it wasn't like I was consciously doing it. I just realized after seven years, oh, maybe I should go do something. And you know, that's how it worked. All right, thank you. Got some, oh. uh, hi, uh, thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, so I was just wondering, it's kind of a weird question, but is there any software out there? You're talking about um, having things scanned and watching reviews and stuff, especially about your own games. Um, is there any software that like goes through annotations of people's like long videos, because some people are longer than others on their reviews? Kind of pulls out points that are important. I haven't come across it, but it sounds like a great thing that could be useful to a small group of people. You know, very useful to a small group, but maybe not really useful for the world. So I don't know if you'd easily find it. You can use things like Metacritic to get like, oh, I want to go read this. I want to go watch this because it it'll get some excerpts and blurbs in there, but it it doesn't do the full thing that you're describing. Cool. Thank you. As you were starting your business, uh, were there any points that you thought you were doing the right thing, but you realized you made like a really critical error in judgment, and you realized you had to backtrack and said, okay, let me fix this up? The first part was, do I think I'm doing the right thing? And yeah, I knew I was doing the right thing because I was now in an industry that was evolving every year. I knew that that was good and healthy for me. So I needed that type of industry. As far as the negative side, um, yeah, I mean, when you first, when you have to kill your first project, that's like a really weird learning experience because you spent so much time doing rah rah, and now you're like, well, okay, we were collectively wrong, but now this whole group of people are invested in that thing, and you have to tell them, no more money. We're going to pack this up and put it in the closet. So that, um, I always have to point out the first time I had to do a layoff, because it was the only time I ever did a layoff. That's a kick where no one wants it. And you're just saying we screwed up collectively. I, I personally know how it happened. I don't have to reveal how it happened. I just know how it happened, and I know how to not ever do it again. And it's a slippery slope you don't want to be on. And so it impacted people's jobs, it impacted people's confidence, and it was not 
my phone. So yeah, I've been there and kind of take that moment to vow never to be there again. So you get smarter through everything you do to hopefully not repeat those types of mistakes. So that's the honest, rough truth of it. Yeah. Um, within the business, which one would you say is more important, learning how to lead or learning how to follow? Well, important can be based off mass need. And so there's obviously more people who are working on teams than leading the team. Because you're dealing with one, in my case, one versus eight or 180, give or take. So, but I have to learn how to follow. My management structure, my management type, is support the team members. So in essence, the first lessons that I probably had to accept were apologizing for something that I didn't do so that I could move on and make sure that that person was starting to move towards happy and healing. Because at, my, at that point, my ego was the elephant in the room. And no, nope, can't have that. So I am the type of manager that wants to support the team members and individuals. And so I have to learn both of those. So it puts more weight on the learn how to be a team member, learn how to follow. Plus when you join another big company, you have to get adopt to their ways. You can't be like saying, oh, well, we're, we're independent. So, nope, we're a wholly, wholly owned subsidiary. We have to be following. But there are ways that you can be a partner even when you're following. Uh, in my experience, I've found, you mentioned when you're pitching a game, one of the things you're outlining are the risks. And I've been in situations where the admission of risk or uncertainty, not knowing how to do something, is taken as kind of a weakness. Like, of course we know how to do everything. You know, none of this is going to be a problem. <laughs> definitely you know, sell 20 million copies. Have you found a way of kind of couching the explanation of risk and uncertainty to shareholders that works really well, or a way of kind of you know, sandwiching it between really cool things, anything like that? Yeah, I think it's, I think it comes from the moment you meet those people. Like, who are you? I am the transparent communicator. I'm just like, look, I won't remember a lie, so there's no reason for me to ever tell one. So I just lay it out there. And I try to package it well, and I try to communicate on those challenges. But we deal with risks all the time. It's just some of them are so common that no one needs to hear them anymore. So we have to focus on the ones that are unique. We have to focus on the ones that are manageable, and show that we can manage them. So I could say that manpower is one of the most critical areas for any project. Well, you offset that by having a good pool of contractors that you've worked with before, or scalable you know, kinds of groups, uh, or in Ubisoft's terms, you have codem partners that are already established. So there are some things that are risks that a well-informed business partner will completely understand and you just acknowledge them. We need to show performance on this new platform by this date, otherwise we know that from thereafter, we're gonna to have to scope control the rest of the project. So risks can just be slightly different deliverable dates. And you just move them accordingly and acknowledge them and build them into your product plan. So maybe the risk is just a word that gets thrown around too much. So they're just known challenges. Otherwise, they're just chaos theory. So I would say that depending on your project, you just have to acknowledge the things that the other person either already knows and you do it to a smaller level, or if they're completely new and they, like when we talked about the, we're talking to bankers and Publishers and whatnot. 
only the things that they would care about. So nowadays you would say, yes, we think we have a target deliverable date. We think we're going to do some external testing that will give us some player feedback. If our metrics aren't good enough, then that might mean that we extend the project ship date because it's more important that we launch with a good user rating, depending on the type of platform it is. So that's an example of if you had to communicate with someone who's totally outside of games, you have to explain to them what the risk is. So I hope in some ways that answers the question to say, it's not old school, just list of random crap. It's more real specific. This equals new deliverable date if this happens and to mitigate it, we suggest this plan. So I think that answers where we're going. Cool. Hi. Um, my question is about the pitching process for expansion content and add-on content. How does that differ from, you know, for my product, how does that differ from an initial pitch, if any? Well, we, we had a great career early on where it was main game mission pack. Sometimes it was main game mission pack, mission pack, and then sequel. So we were really good at that at the beginning. And it came down to what's new, what's different, what's going to change, and were those investments important enough? Did we really need to chase, change the user interface between this game and this game? Well, if it came with a good tech, technological leap or it came with some savings, then we could say, this is why we need to do this. So there was a functional, this is why we need to do this. And there's a gameplay, this is why we need to do this. And then there's just something that I did skip over is the team members. The team members have to have a reason to want to work on the sequel or mission pack. They're the ones who are going to come in super hyped about a new idea. So I don't have to make a choice on this is the setting we should do. It's like the team members, they should be choosing it. And one of my other favorite things to say is, it's like we are making choices that is a scope control decision that gives a direction to the team, but that lane has to be wide enough that they enjoy the ride. So we can't just go, you know, that's, that's no fun. You know? so, so I hope that that tells you that yes, it's a choice, but we want to actually give a lot of that creative freedom to the team members, and we want to hear from the audience about what they think is interesting, and then we want to scope control it so it can be doable within a small window. It's also historically been a great chance for us to try new people in new roles, so we have a business reason why we think they're actually really good for people as well. Yep. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry. We'll go there. Yeah, so first I wanted to thank you very much for your time, and I'm sure I don't just speak for myself when I say we, we all really appreciate your feedback and general experience. It's very, very helpful for a lot of us. Um, so I had a question about, um, it's a little bit more difficult, but related. Um, in regards to, I'm sure you've had to deal with this, uh, dealing with you know, early on in the industry. Um, when it comes out with emerging concepts that you know are going to be great or you know very smartly built, um, when pitching these concepts that are generally unheard of, um, what would you say, like for example, in regards to like VR or you know, new things that are coming right now, for example, um, what would be a positive thing to always stick to when you're pitching? And what would be one thing to always avoid when you're pitching these concepts? Well, I only touched on that a very little bit, so it's a great question. It's your pitch needs to align with your studio. So we fall into the golden handcuffs or, or trappings of people expect a certain type of game from Red Storm, that's fine. Now what's happened over the years is after we were acquired by Ubisoft, they've actually allowed us to open up again. So we had a bunch of people work on Rocksmith and we're like, hey, this is fun, this is cool. You know, but we couldn't do that under the Red Storm label. We could only do that under the Ubisoft label. So your concept still needs to make sense for you, your company, what the expectation is from your fan base, or anything like that. And if you're new, it's blank. But it still needs to relate to your personal potential. And so we tell the stories of success-based design decisions that once we had momentum in a brand, that kind of dictated a lot about what we could do in the future. And people kind of 
started to expect a certain thing. And so that means certain pitches would come up and I'd say, that's an interesting idea, but most likely we're gonna have to give that over to UB. And if another studio picks it up, and you might have to go there if you really want to champion this idea. So that's always potential with bigger places. Uh, smaller places, you obviously have freedom. You can do shotgun design. You can just do latest, greatest, fun stuff. But that kind of kind of usually falls down into the smaller indie game market, and, and I don't represent that. And so I, I can only say, this is how we do it. These are the trappings that come from how we do it and other groups will have different successes and freedoms that we would never have. Um, hi, um, so I had a question about, um, so those long extended sprints of vaca no vacation for like seven <laughs> years, how does that end up um, applying, in, like how does that affect, uh, I guess, ego cycles of like feeling important to the company or feeling kind of defeated and also do like these cycles of increased ego and then kind of humbling like speed checks, do they have like diminishing returns or are there like a retention of overall just a like, humility if you push yourself in the right direction? Well, that really gets into personal DNA. I, I consider myself to be a, a, a very patient person and I'm gonna pitch the value of the team more than the value of me. Uh, I, I understand that there's probably a value that I bring, but I'm just not gonna highlight that as you know, you know, our studio doesn't revolve around me. I, I affect the culture, and that's important because we try to make sure that people can be happy there. So uh, in terms of those bumps in the road, then yeah, they, they're very humbling, but you still have a job to do. You know, I mean, people look to you to say, uh, okay, we just wrecked the car, or where's the new car, how do we get on? past this, and you gotta get over it. You know, you have a responsibility to them to keep moving forward. So those are challenges that, you know, I mean, I'd hopefully say they're avoidable, but, you know, someone else is gonna have a different bump in the road or train wreck or whatever. Uh, and if you are a leader, then, well, that's your task, you, you know. You need to assess the situation. Sometimes you need to say, I don't have the answer to that right now. Give me a moment to think about it. So it's okay to not be perfect. You just have to leverage on communication during those gaps. So my best advice for that is to be, if, you, if, you're, if you're like me, then I say be transparent, be communicative. It's okay to say you don't have the answer to something, but that's another way of saying, help me out, help us through this, we'll get through it together, you know, whatever it might be. So, tough one. Yep. Uh, so, I actually had a couple more questions and then I'll, I'll leave you alone after that. But, uh, <laughs> so, so uh, firstly, from, from what you said, um, would you say the, uh, that contributing an expansion or additional content is very similar in a lot of regards to a sequel? They're different because they're usually quick turns. You want to have as, a, a, as easy a narrative jump from one to another. And so, you know, I kind of think of them as half steps. We weren't shy when we internally talked them about 1.5s as opposed to like a full sequel would be, would be the next number. So would discussion about that happen during, while you were developing the first one, it might be like an idea for more content would pop up? Or yeah. content you didn't have time to make originally might make. No, it. no. We try to make sure that the game has the original offering as much as possible. So it wasn't like the stuff on the cutting room floor became the mission packs. Uh, they were independent. They were on their own. They were they were solid. It's just they were smaller offering, and they were designed to be a smaller offering uh, because what they gave us us what they gave us the opportunity to do was to plan the sequel with a smaller group of people behind the scenes. So part of the group would move over onto the mission pack, another part could move over on the sequel, and we needed this leapfrogging so that we weren't ever sitting dead in the water. So you can design one game and make a game, but if you're gonna design a company, 
a studio, then you're thinking more than just about the one game that you're on. You're thinking about the rhythm of business and how you're going to correlate that to kind of leapfrogging from one to another. So you don't want there to be any point in which there is just not any project going on. No, I, I mean, I'm willing to throw stuff away if I have to. If we take a misstep and to say, okay, well, sorry guys, we're going to move over here with this, or we're going to delay that, or we're going to actually add to it, we're going to make that mission pack suddenly become a sequel. It's like you can have change and you can have damage control, but uh, I prefer the sense of an organized structure. It worked very well for Red Storm in the beginning. You can just look at the, the list and go, okay, Rainbow, Rainbow Expansion, Rogue Spear, Expansion, Expansion. Then we did the same thing with Ghost. It was like Ghost and then Expansion, Expansion. So that was how the market was during those early years. And it worked perfectly. And now you can easily relate that to Seasons because it's very much a parallel. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I, I don't play that sort of first so, person okay. very much, but uh, yeah. It's just a list. You can look at it on the website. Okay. And you, you know, you can see a rhythm of business mm -hmm. and you can apply that. You know, I don't have to play all the games out there. I can just analyze them, their deliverable dates and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, I know, I know you said you don't represent indie games, but what, are there any suggestions for how you, what, how you could, um, what you would do differently? Just thoughts you, I know you don't have any experience with indie games, but like suggestions you might have on how, how to do, because as an indie game, you don't have the investors, well you might, but you might not. It could, it could be just, you're funding it yourself, and you probably don't have a publisher, I mean you might, but assuming you don't have those things, it's just you, your team, and your customers. How, and how in the beginning do you, would you do it differently in terms of pitching to your team? So for me, I do, since I don't do it, I start my investigation by looking at the credits of the indie games that I find that are most interesting to me that might be similar to the idea I'm thinking about. Because that starts with the honest gut check of, damn, I didn't know it took 25 people to make this. So you can then start to read the research, you can go to the websites, you can do all the things to go down their rabbit hole to try to figure out how did they make that game? What would that pitch look like and how do I do something of similar scope if I have similar capabilities? So I think that you can just you can just wing it and run the risk of a few train wrecks. Or you can say, I want to find some parallels in the existing industry mm -hmm. to learn a little bit about. Maybe you can actually knock on the door or watch the reviews or do something to gain a little bit of real information. Um, but Otherwise, it's just like this, you know, come to, come to a show, learn a little bit more. So there's so many wonderful examples of indie games that have been very successful that I don't want to do them a disservice. I just want to say they've done a great job and do your research on that as much as possible. And everything else applies. Scope control, those games are usually elegant on one axis of creativity. They're really focused down on one mechanic, the one example that I gave game getting over it. It's like, that game does one thing, yeah. but it's enough to support that game. And so that's a very unique kind of property. So do, so do your research, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's deeper than that, but, but you're looking for those as life preservers. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to make you feel more confident that it's actually, oh, this was done over this amount of time with this many people. You can say, oh, it was done in this technology. Now I know it's doable in Unity. Now I know it's doable with 10 people or less. So those are things that can help you just to reduce the size of the unknown mountain. Um, as a member of a team, how would you go about like admitting that a pitch is something that you will not be able to work on or just have no general interest in? So when I'm doing a pitch jam, asking for it, and I've had one you know, successful run on that, and I 
use it as an example when I'm doing these lectures, is I will over-communicate at the beginning. These are the rules for the pitch jam. And it really details out that we might not be able to get one publishable idea out of this, but it doesn't change the fact that this can be a fun experience and that we can do this and we can use it as a learning experience. So being really honest up front helps. And that training has to happen over and over again because people will just come in with ideas occasionally and maybe they weren't here during the pitch jam. So you have to say, yes, this is our structure for submitting ideas. These are things that we need to do about the ideas. Uh, because, you know, just like any company, we have to ask for funding to do more and different work. So we need to make people understand that these are business choices and that choice needs to be relevant to the studio and the company. And then some of those same things, as I said earlier, is it doable by our team? Is it doable by our engine? What is it going to do in terms of cost? And how could those people be useful elsewhere? So we have to make sure that anyone giving a pitch understands my side of the story, which is a business side, and I'm trying to understand their creative side. And then somewhere in between, we talk about the crazy stuff of does it have a market? And you know, is it, is it something that we should make? Almost always it can be made. Uh, and overwhelmingly, when a pitch is rejected, it tends to be because it's half an idea. And sometimes we have to encourage them to find the other half. So that's a little bit on the negative sides of pitch given. So we try to be as helpful. We try to make sure that they can walk away with something, how to do the next step. Hi. Um, so my question is more on if you're working with an international team, like say you have like the American branch, but yep. you also have say a French branch or a Japanese branch, are the pitches from international teams markedly different in their processes, or is it more or less similar to if you're working with like just the American team or just the French team, or I guess also like different countries? Are there's is there any major differences between each country's processes? Well, I can only tell you a stupid story about how communication fails when you, when you, not us, Partner Studio, when Partner Studio asked for monster trucks from the Japanese studio, and they got monster trucks. <laughs> well, that kind of shows you that verbal communication, not the best methodology. You gotta really lay out your details when you're crossing borders. When you change language base, you have to be more descriptive. So basically make sure that as much as possible is kept in translation. Yeah, you really have to make sure you go to an extra level of communication. So we've worked with multiple different countries and uh, we just, we, we manage that. We try to keep it in mind that One of the things that I rah rah with some people on is uh, when you're speaking to a person from another country, you cannot judge their intelligence by their vocal patterns. Because often they're having to slow down and do translation in their speech. So you have the benefit of the American, and they are trying to meet you halfway by speaking your language. So you have to meet them to embrace the fact that they are trying to get their points across in a, in a language that's not native to them. I guess kind of a second thing is in working in an international company, um, would you recommend trying to pick up one of the languages of the other branches, like say, like the aforementioned, like if they have a French branch, would you recommend learning at least a bit of French or Japanese or the it, Japanese? It's good if you intend to work in an international publishing group and if you're targeting the big studios, that gives you so many open doors. I mean, if, you, if you're just like, I want to double the number of jobs that I can apply for, that's a great way of doing it. I can say that I'm not really great with languages, so I try to compensate everywhere else. I 
try to be good at all the things that I can be good at. So if it fits in your checklist of your 10 things that make you you, and you like that, and you want to open those doors, then I say, yeah, it does. It helps you be a better you. It just doesn't fit on my list because I'm not good at it. So my checklist of my 10 things, slightly different, and like I said, it leverages on the skills that I can most be the best me. Um, so as I'm starting to network and get my group of people that I'm actively working with, it gets, it's ever increasing. Um, I find that sometimes it gets very time consuming to properly put the right amount of time in with every single person that I'm working with. So I'm thinking about if I want to get feature leads or department leads who will generally take control of a specific aspect of the project and take the reins on it with autonomy. Um, what are good ways to identify those individuals in my network and what are good ways that I can cultivate those skills in We've had a couple different management structures over the years. So we did have the mid-level managers for a certain part of it. And then as people got better at their jobs overall, that mid-level management group was dissolved because we felt like people had uplifted past that point. There was also the awkwardness of having two managers. The, I work on the team for this producer, but I also work for my art director. Which one am I supposed to listen to? So I've grown away from that model because I can rely on the level of skills from individuals. So I represent both of what you're asking, is to say, yes, that works, and you can look for the best teachers, the best cultivators, the parent models, you know, it's a person who likes to uplift other people. But you need to be honest with those individuals along the way to say, if we're successful, your job goes away. Because eventually, if people stay with you and they become talented enough, they no longer need those structures, and you won't need those structures either. So halfway through our development, we switch to what we probably call the fully empowered team model, which means the senior producer was really running that whole group of people, and we became support for them. So, two different models. Needed the early one early on, dissolved it halfway through.